So uh, as I mentioned before, our first uh, presenter is Dr. Amore Nora, who is a professor of higher education, co-director of the Center for Research Policy and Education, and associate dean for research and college of education and human development at the University of Texas at San Antonio. His research has focused on theoretical perspectives relating to student persistence, the role of college on diverse student populations across institutions, and development of retention models that integrate economic theories and psychosocial perspectives within college persistence frameworks. He has, um, he has contributed to traditional as well as non-traditional lines of research on college student persistence. And he has served on numerous editorial boards, some of which include the research in higher education, the review of higher education, and many more. He is currently a member of the Technical Review Panel for the U.S. Department of Education, the National Center for Education Statistics, and uh, National Science Foundation. And I could read many more. His uh, experiences are wonderful. He has numerous uh, research paper presentations at many conferences. Some include at the Association for the Study of Higher Education, the American Educational Research Association, and the Association of Institutional Research. We are so pleased he has agreed to join us today to share three of his uh, research studies on the impact of cognitive and social so, psychosocial factors on Hispanic student success. And uh, once again, please, as Dr. Nora shares his uh, findings and his research, type in your questions and uh, I will capture them for you. Dr. Nora? Hi, I, <clears throat> I want to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation. I'm going to begin this with a focus on the theoretical framework that was used in terms of guiding the research on those three studies that were mentioned, which we'll get to in a little bit later on. The uh, main theoretical framework uh, on which this was based is Nora's uh, student uh, engagement model. Of course, that's my own model. I hate to sort of self-advertise, but it, it was a model. My model consists of three main components, if you like. Uh, one is the pre-college factors, or those characteristics that students bring, bring with them as they enter our colleges. The second component is the one, the college experiences, those kind of social and academic experiences that they encounter as they, you know, are enrolled in our colleges. And then the third major component is a sort of a combination of both intermediate and final outcomes. And I'll be a little bit more specific about those as, you know, I, I talk through them. Uh, but before going on and talking specifically about those three components, I do want to say that uh, embedded within the theoretical framework that was used to guide the research, uh, it does incorporate theoretical perspectives from other researchers such as Dr. Rendon and her validation theory, Dr. Solorzano at UCLA on microaggressions, Dr. Crisp on the mentoring model, and uh, Terry Oso on her cultural wealth model. Uh, but let's uh, go ahead and start then with the first one. If you notice at, uh, at the top, it says pre-college and environmental factors. It, it sort of combines two different categories. The pre-college, if you'll notice, includes the academic preparation, the type of, you know, grades that they make, the type of courses that they took, whether they were in science or mathematics or, you know, whatever other topics that they, you know, uh, were enrolled in. Um, but it also sort of includes then the, the high school psychosocial factors, and those are kind of the, the social experiences that students have when they are enrolled in high school that also have a carryover effect in terms of once they enroll and enter into our higher ed institutions. And then very important, of course, is the encouragement and support from significant others. And those do include parents and teachers and counselors, but the most important of those 
uh, different categories are, you know, the support and encouragement that our students receive from our parents. The, the final set that I noticed on this slide is the environmental pull factors. These are those uh, factors that have a tendency to pull students away from completing and persisting. And those include the family responsibilities when, in fact, the students have to leave either while they're in high school or even it carries over in terms of when they're enrolled in college, of having to go back home and take care of a sibling or a grandparent or someone. The second one is work responsibilities. And those are work outside of the campus. So we're talking about getting out of class and going and working at, you know, somewhere like a, an HEB grocery store or a McDonald's or somewhere like that. And the third one is commuting to college. And we look at that in terms of the pool factor because we're looking at the distance that students have to travel in order to go ahead and engage in their higher education. Um, the next set of factors, uh, and let me move over to the next slide. Uh, the next set of factors are the college-related factors. And those are kind of, uh, in a global sense, uh, the purpose and the education institutional alliances. Those include the educational aspirations, the desire to earn a degree that students bring with them as, again, as they become enrolled in our institutions. It also is not only in terms of the desire to reach a specific educational goal, but also the commitment to a specific institution, the one that they have decided that they want to you know, go to. The next category are, is the academic and social experiences. This is a big category. This is what is going on once the students are enrolled in our institutions. And they involve things such as learning communities. What kind of do they engage in study groups with each other? Do they engage in more of a collaborative participation within the classroom? We, of course, have social experiences, their you know, involvement in clubs and organizations. And then we also have campus climate. Those are important because what we begin to look at are such things as discriminatory behaviors and gestures on these campuses, as well as the degree of tolerance that the students can feel at those campuses. Validating experiences is another important variable or characteristic. That is the, the, the degree of validation that the students feel when they're inside the classroom that they receive from faculty, as well as from administration as well. And then the last one is the mentoring experience. And mentoring is not necessarily in terms of a specific program, but rather certain, uh, certain dimensions that are involved within that experience that they can receive either from counselors or faculty or even their friends and even family. All right, uh, we move on then to the next part of the model. And this is still talking with relationship to what goes on you know, at the institution. And those are the cognitive and the non-cognitive outcomes. When we look at the academic and intellectual development, we're talking, of course, about grade point average and how well they do. But we're also looking in terms of gains in critical thinking and science reasoning that also have to be considered. The non-cognitive gains or the area where we begin to look in terms of civic engagement, volunteerism in the community, and those types of, of uh, activities. The goal determination and in the institutional alliance, allegiance is really sort of looking in terms of how much more solid those educational goals, the commitment to earning a goal is at the end of the year. Have they been solidified and reinforced? And are they still wanting and have that same commitment to earning that degree at that institution in which they are enrolled? I'm going to go ahead and show you now the full model, but we're going to go ahead and expand it so that uh, it, there's a lot in it. <laughs> if you notice, the first two blocks really are those pre-collegiate uh, uh, set of variables that I was talking about. These are the ones that students bring with them as they enroll in our colleges. And then from there, they, there uh, we get that educational uh, aspirations that they finally formulate before they enter. The next one, the bigger uh, column, are those academic and social experiences with, uh, again, the idea of the degree of engagement and the degree of involvement that they have within the institution. The last three 
really are kind of those cognitive and non-cognitive gains, what we really refer to as both the intermediate outcomes as well as the final outcome. Within the model, the emphasis is that when we look at those cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes, they're intermediate because the academic performance at the end of the year, the perceived gains that they have in terms of critical thinking and all of those, all of these sort of tend to be these intermediate outcomes that have a tendency to, again, impact the final educational growth of the degree attainment and the commitment to and having a sense of belonging and they feel that being at that institution is worthwhile. And so all of these variables, all of them put together, come together, intertwined within, you know, interact with each other to finally have an influence on the re-enrollment in higher education. In other words, do they persist? either from the first year to the second year, or they, do they persist from the beginning of the first year all the way to graduation? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on now to the, the first study. And as you can tell, the title was a retrospective study of Hispanic college students. In this study, what we did was uh, we looked at an, uh, students that were at a Hispanic serving institution, and the student sample included all of the students that entered for the first time at this particular institution in the fall of 2006. Now, what we did then is that we followed all of these students through all of their institutional records and were able to get every piece of information that the institution had between 2006 all the way to spring of 2013. And of course, that included a total number of students of 3,803, of which 1,185 were Hispanic students and 1,918 were white students. Now, what was really phenomenal about this study was that when we went and asked for the institutional records, we were actually able to get 462 variables of institutional data. And this included, for example, things such as demographics, course load, financial aid, and uh, the, the data was just wonderful. It was full of so much information. Uh, let's, the, the intent of this study really was to sort of address a set of assertions regarding Latino students, okay? Sort of things that we have heard. Well, you know, I thought that this is what we believed with regarding, you know, our Latino uh, students in, in college. Well, the first assertion looked at where Latino males are disproportionately underrepresented in higher education among different racial and ethnic groups. And I think you hear that again over and over that we do have the disappearing or the vanishing Latino male. And while that may be true in terms of looking uh, collectively, that there are differences geographically with regard to this you know, assertion. Instead of that assertion, what we found was that 45% of the student population consisted of white male and female students. However, the total enrollment of Latino male and female students were about 42%. And what was sort of looking at and more at the assertion was the fact that there was only a 2% uh, difference in percentage points between Hispanic females and Hispanic males. 22% were females and 20% were males. We then move on to the second assertion, and that is that the great majority of Latino students attend college on a part-time basis. And so we looked at this, again, going from 2006 all the way to 2013, and instead what we found was that an overwhelming majority of Latino and non-Latino students enrolled in college on a full-time basis. We were sort of very surprised by this finding, but we went ahead and checked it two or three times and found that native male students, you know, attended 97% at full-time basis and female students 96%. By native students as opposed to transfer students, what we mean is that native students are those students that come out of high school and come directly to the four-year institution that we were studying. Transfer students, of course, would have gone first to a community college and then they would have transferred there. But even among transfer students, we found that 75% of them were enrolled full time. Moving on to the next assertion <coughs> is that a great majority of Latino students do not come from family backgrounds where social capital is available. I do need to say that 
the way that we operationally define social capital in this way was the educational attainment of either the father or the mother or combined, okay? Because the research has shown that students that have parents who have that type of educational experience or attainment are, of course, more likely to encourage their students to go on. So what we were looking at was, well, how much of a social capital do our students bring with them nowadays? Instead, what we found is while Hispanic students do record lower levels of social capital, less parents who do have either a BA or an MA or a doctorate, we did find that nearly 50% come from families whose parents had acquired some level of college education or had earned already degrees. Moving on, we go to the fourth assertion, and that is that Latino students enroll in developmental courses fall into a black hole of remediation and do not continue their education. In other words, once they're in remedial education, that's it, they're lost, they're never gonna continue. What we found at this four-year institution is that 69% of Hispanic students <coughs> that were enrolled in at least one developmental course were successful in completing that course and moving on to non-remedial or degree counting courses. I think that main, the main the assertion is one that has been applied to community colleges where you know the assertion again is also that they take so many developmental courses that they never continue after that. Moving on now to the fifth assertion is that Latino college performance is way below that of their white uh, counterparts, all right? Instead, this is what we found at this HSI, that if we looked at Hispanic undergraduate students, there are two columns, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and highlight this. And the first column is the persistence rate. And there's two persistence rates in here. From the fall of 2006 to the fall of 2007, which is from the first year to the second year, the second row is from the beginning of their first year to four years later, okay? And what we did is we looked at their persistence rate during those two periods, as well as their overall GPA. And if you'll notice, what we found was that for Latino students, that 63% went ahead, persisted between the first and the second year, and four years later, they had a 31% persistence rate, as opposed to uh, white uh, counterparts, which from the first to the second year, the first it was 55%, and then from the first to the fourth year, it was the 24%. In terms of grade point averages, there really was very, very little difference in terms of, they, there was a tendency for them to, to get better as they stayed longer in college. The, uh, the last assertion uh, in regard to that first study was uh, that, uh, Latino students lag far behind white students in terms of STEM degrees uh, earned or attained. And instead, and again, what we found at this HSI institution, which incidentally I forgot to mention earlier, is an aspiring tier one institution. So it is one where it, it is even very competitive in terms of admissions. And uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of context with regard to the type of institution that we're talking about. And, and the Latino students there. Instead, what we found was that of the 604 science degrees that were earned in STEM fields the four years later after we started, Hispanics earned 368 or 61% of those degrees, and white students earned 236 or 39%. So again, uh, this one particular institution is doing really, really well with regard to getting students, Latino students involved in STEM fields and, and earning degrees. Okay, we're going to move on now to the second study, okay, which was also one related to STEM. And in this study, the title is Student Characteristics, Pre-College, College, and Environmental Factors as Predictors of Majoring in and Earning a STEM Degree. And an analysis of students attending a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, as we go through the first one, there were four major uh, research questions within this study, okay? The first one was more of a descriptive uh, research question. Are there significant differences or relationships between the characteristics of Hispanics 
and white students and STEM majors at a Hispanic-serving institution. In other words, we were looking, are there differences between white students and Hispanic students, and are there differences in terms of those that were majoring in a STEM major versus those that were not majoring in STEM? The second, third, and fourth uh, questions really look more specifically in terms of what factors were predictive of, one, the decision to declare a major in STEM. The second one was to change from a non-STEM major to a STEM major. And the last one is the predicted STEM degree attainment. So as we look at the findings, what we find in this first one is um, that first question of the, the, the profile, okay? If we look in here, one of the, uh, let me get uh, my pointer, okay? As we look through the first variable, which was the financial aid, those that received Pell Grant and those that did not receive Pell Grant, the major differences that we found, uh, some of them were not very big, others were, they might have been a little bit significant, but not that that much. What we find is that there was no difference mainly between like Hispanic students that were not in STEM majors versus those that were in STEM majors. The same thing between white students that were not in STEM majors versus those that were in STEM majors. The major differences, of course, were between Hispanic and white. Those that received Pell Grants, of course, Hispanic students were in a higher proportion of receiving Pell Grants as opposed to white students, both in terms of STEM and non-STEM majors. The second sort of category was in terms of those that were first generation. Again, there really was not much of a difference between uh, Hispanic students that were in a STEM major versus those that were not. Same thing for white students that were in a non-STEM major and those that were. The major difference came between, again, by ethnicity in terms of Hispanic students versus white students, with more, uh, of course, Hispanic students being in the first generation. Another variable was whether they attended part-time or, or, or full-time. Now, this data sort of substantiates what we had already found in our first study. There is a little bit of a difference. We found that it was 97% you know, students that were going full-time. Here, though, if you can see across, we're pretty much certain that about three-fourths of our students were going full-time with only about a fourth, and it varies, okay? but a fourth of our students were then part-time. Again, the majority of our, both Hispanic and uh, white students are going to college full-time. The biggest difference that we found was with this third variable and maybe with the last one in terms of GPA, the mean SAT, SAT math scores. You can see that, in fact, those Hispanic students that were not in STEM majors had a much lower uh, score than those who were going into the STEM field. The same thing was true for white students who were in the non-STEM major versus those that were going into STEM courses. And of course, the other difference was between white students and uh, Hispanic students. Uh, the last one I'll focus on and then we'll move on uh, is in terms of GPA, all right? The GPA, again, being a little bit lower for Hispanic students that were not in STEM majors versus those that were, the same thing for white students who were not in STEM majors versus those that were. And so uh, here we're just, the first research question just simply looked in terms of were there differences in certain characteristics, you know, among both ethnicity and whether they were in, major versus, uh, in STEM majors versus non-STEM majors. In this second one, here if you, uh, I need to, oh, there it is, I'm sorry. I lost my arrow. <laughs> if here are the three research questions that we were asking, what of many of these variables in here, these predictive variables, had any influence on students declaring a STEM major, on changing to a STEM, from a non-STEM to a STEM major, and earning a STEM major, okay? And so what we found that was in terms of declaring a, a STEM major, that females were less likely to declare, that females were also less likely to change from a non-STEM to a STEM, and females were less likely to earn a STEM degree. What we did find also was this, that for Asian American students, they were more likely to declare a STEM major, they were more likely to change from a non-STEM to a STEM, and they were more likely also to earn a degree. Now, I have to tell you a little bit of when they said they're more likely. The comparison group in this type of an analysis 
is always in terms of white students. So in comparison to white students, were African American students more likely to, to declare a major? No, we did not find that to be significant. They were not more likely. So that's the comparison that you have to look at. First generation also did not have an impact in terms of either declaring, changing, or earning. In terms of the pre-college variables, such as SAT scores, this one came out significant again all the way across, that in terms of declaring a STEM major, in terms of changing degrees to a STEM major, and also earning a degree, it was very, very significant. Uh, we, I won't go through the rest of it because really this was really the one that just stood out the most and sort of looked at the importance of math scores and the math preparation the students bring with them. Okay? Now, from here we move on to the third study because I think I'm running out of my time and I don't want to do that. Uh, the third study then, yes, and let me move this out of here, are the cognitive and the psychosocial factors that are impacting students' sense of belonging and the academic performance. There were sort of like two sub-studies in this third study. What we wanted to look at was what predictors, what predicts a student's sense of belonging and what predicts their academic performance. Sense of belonging has been one of the most important factors in the literature that has come up consistently over and over and over again, that when students feel that they belong at an institution, when they feel that they're being cared about, and when they feel that they should be there, it has a big, big influence on them staying in college and persisting all the way to graduation. So what we wanted to look at was, okay, well then, what predictors then predict that sense of belonging, and what predictors predict how well they do academically? So we'll go, we'll start with the first one in terms of uh, sense of belonging to give you a little bit of a background. This study looked, actually sampled more than 22,300 and 2,500 graduates that were enrolled in the spring of 2014 semester. We decided to just go ahead and include every single undergraduate, whether they were freshmen, juniors, seniors, or sophomores, all right? And what we did get, and this is really something that, uh, I, that we're really proud of, <laughs> is the response rate. I know that it looks at like 24.6%, but believe me, when you're doing research on these students at a four-year institution, you're looking at a 10% or a 12% response rate. We had over 5,484 students. Of course, we gave a prize, and the grand prize was we could have an $800 uh, parking permit in order to get in, which created quite a bit of an incentive. The, the next thing that I wanted to really emphasize is that we went ahead and merged a whole bunch of these psychosocial student perceptions with actual institutional records. So in addition to there being 37 psychosocial factors, it also included demographics, course load, financial assistance, overall GPA. There were so, so many variables within this that we're trying to capture that first theoretical framework that I talked to you about. All of the psychosocial factors were measured in a Likert scale with going ranging from strongly agree all the way to strongly disagree. So here are the findings. There were, well, before the findings, here was sort of like the hypothesized model, all right? There were six blocks of variables that were entered into the analysis. Pre-college characteristics, student finances, financial aid, social experiences on and off campus, the number of hours that they attempted and the number of hours they earned, a set of variables that we call the choking, when you crash, and I'll explain that a little bit later on, and then the student's collegiate experiences as well. Now, one of the things that I want to mention now before going into one of those particular sets of variables is that under each one of these blocks, it is not a single variable that we're looking at. There are a, a combination or a collection of different uh, items that represent different variables. So let's say within pre-college characteristics, there were two or three or four variables. Within student finances, it included not only how much uh, aid they received, but also whether they felt that that aid helped them or not, both tangible and intangible components. So I wanted to go ahead and mention that before moving on. In here, this choke factor is really sort of looking at when students come in, 
sometimes it's like they hit a wall because there's some negative perceptions that they send as they're on that campus. And so what we wanted to do as a block in itself was to look in terms of which one of those variables within this block had an impact on their sense of belonging and as well as on their academic performance. This included things as the perception of discriminatory gestures and behaviors on the, camp on the campus. Not necessarily that they personally experienced them, but that they saw them. Whether they felt that they felt that an HSI institution marginalized Hispanic students. That even if others sort of did not believe in that, that you had what it took to make it in college, that they were they remained committed to earning a college degree, sort of a, a, a sense of resiliency. That they were lo felt lost and intimidated during their first year at an HSI. That they felt that there was a sense of difficulty balancing roles and responsibilities. And we move on, you know, to the others. Those are that fifth block. The sixth block then look at some things that are kind of like more current. The use of technology for learning, class assignments, and social media. What kind of an impact are we having with all of this iPads and you know, smartphones and all of that? The second one are the mentoring experiences. Things like coping strategies or reflective discussions with someone in terms of your career, where you're going, as well as one of the things that we have found to be really important, a realistic self-assessment that engages the student looking inward in terms of assessing the skills and the strengths and weaknesses that they have. The other thing is looking at collaborative learning experiences, that particularly as they go outside of the classroom. Do you get together with students in study groups and does that really make a difference? And then the last one is the perception that they have been validated by faculty. Do they feel that in terms of not only being engaged, but that their opinions and their views are being validated in the classroom? All right, I'll go real quickly through this. The first were the findings for a sense of belonging. The plus, the plus just means that it had a positive impact. The negative means that it had a you know, negative impact on, again, the sense of belonging. Socializing on campus was a positive. The next positive was the hours earned during the spring semester, okay? And that means when students earn a certain degree, the, the more hours that they earn, the more impact that they had that they felt a sense of belonging. The third positive one was that they had a strong sense of resiliency or perseverance. No matter what, I am going to stick with this. Then the next one is a discussion when we involve students in racial and ethnic issues with each other that had a positive influence on, again, feeling part of that institution, and that they felt that they had made gains in a racial identity. The last two positive are the engagement in collaborative learning experiences, such as study groups, and the validation of, stu of, of students by the faculty. Uh, you, you, you've got this, you can go through the negative ones and see, in fact, uh, you know, what, what we found uh, as we move along. But I do want to get then to the next thing. When we look over here in terms of the overall academic achievement, and what we wanted to do was to look at the same set of variables that we had looked at in the sense of belonging, but break them down by freshman students, sophomore students, juniors, and seniors. And here's what we found, all right? Uh, with regard to freshman students, the positives were, again, the number of hours that they earned. The more hours that they earned, both in the fall and the spring semester, the more likely they were to uh, have uh, a good overall academic performance. If they felt validated uh, by faculty in the classroom, it was also very predictive of having a better overall performance. And the involvement, believe it or not, in high school extracurricular activities. So that's the carryover that we found as the students come in from high school into their first year in college, that carries over and it's important. The negatives are, you know, perceptions of discriminatory behavior and some of the others, but I'm running out of time and I don't want to spend too much time on all of them. When it came to sophomore students, the positives were the high school rank in, you know, uh, in high school, the number of hours, again, that they earned, uh, and then one, which was the involvement in high school extracurricular activities. Now, what we did find that was a little bit strange was that we feel that mentoring is good all the time, but when it came to sophomore students, their mentoring experiences, both on and off campus, seem to have had a negative impact. 
We're not really quite sure. We're looking into that a little bit more, but it was something that you know really sort of stuck out uh, to us. Uh, in terms of juniors, the positives included their high school rank and the size of the high school where they came from in terms of them doing better in academically, the hours again that they earned. Uh, the mentoring experiences for juniors, however, turn out to be a positive influence on them and their involvement, again, in high school extracurricular activities. Uh, again, the negatives were such things as they felt overwhelmed and stressed. There was a lot of financial worry and stress because they felt that somehow financial aid had not met their needs uh, and things of that nature. Um, then finally, for seniors, what we find is that the high school rank, the size, the hours earned in both fall and spring were all positive, okay? And a lot of the other negatives were there. But the most interesting thing, and this is my last slide, the most interesting thing was that in terms of how much of this variance can we predict? I mean, how, what can we look at in terms of a set of variables that will predict whether they do well academically or not? It explained a lot more of the variance for freshmen, it went down as we went from freshman to sophomore to junior all the way to seniors. So what does that tell us that this model that we're using, if we start applying them evenly all the way throughout, we're missing out on some theoretical constructs that may be even more important in terms of predicting their academic performance as they stay more and more in college. So. I, I like this is the last slide then. <laughs> I think that the whole emphasis of the last slide is that there's still a very great need for more research on Hispanic students, especially when it comes to the STEM field. And I will leave it at that and thank you again.